One of the craziest stories I've ever heard is that of Kyle Odom, the bright young college student who one day snapped and shot six hollow point rounds into a pastor he believed was a reptilian. Now what makes this story even stranger is the fact that the pastor came out of this relatively unharmed, returned to work two weeks later, and then was elected to a prominent government position. Even though he was shot five times in the torso and once in the head with hollow point rounds. So let's start to unpack why Kyle thought it was necessary to pull off this heinous crime to begin with. The answer to this question lies in his manifesto, which can be found on the Internet Archive. But let's start with who is Kyle Odom? Born and raised in North Idaho, he grew up in a loving family. He joined the Marine Corps after high school and developed an interest in science. He went to school for a degree in biochemistry. He won numerous scholarships and awards. He graduated magna cum laude, then joined the University of Idaho. So why would he do this? Why would he throw his life away when he had so much to live for? Well, according to him, his life was ruined. It was ruined by an intelligent species of amphibian humanoids from Mars. I wish I was joking. So here are the bullet points that Odom wants people to know about these amphibian humanoids. Basically, they were here long before we ever existed. Their technology is millions of years more advanced than ours, and he's seen them do things that defy all comprehension. They have a massive breeding stock of humans, which they breed and control from birth. They use these humans to live vicarious lives among us. They appear to be completely normal because they're good at imitating human behavior. Now, the actual Martians live deep underground, here and inside of the moon. They take control of wild human beings and use them as sex slaves. Don't believe me, he says? Well, ask Obama to take a lie detector test on this one. He says, they tried to take me, but they were unable to control my mind, and they've been following me ever since. I tried everything to get my life back. I begged, bargained, and I threatened. I attempted suicide twice, but they stopped me both times. My last resort was to take actions that would bring this to the public's attention. So everything started for Kyle when he was at the University of Idaho in the spring of 2014. It was the final semester, and he was taking a heavy course load. The stress was mounting. So Kyle searched for a way to cope, and what he discovered was meditation. He made it his daily routine, and he got really good at it. Now, this continued until he encountered another being through meditation. Essentially, he went into another realm, and this entity telepathically told him, you shouldn't be here. Instantly, Kyle felt guilty for trespassing into this psychedelic realm. And this emotion he had had a positive impact on this being, who then considered Kyle to be a good guy. And I guess they merged, and he felt unconditional love. Their minds became connected, and it was an extremely powerful and life-altering experience. Now, the rest of that semester suddenly became exceedingly easy for Kyle. He felt like he had tapped into some kind of power. He exerted no mental effort, aced all of his tests, and did amazing, even in classes that were extremely difficult before. So after he graduated college, he started to interview for graduate school, and he accepted an offer from Baylor College of Medicine to work on a PhD in human genetics. This Kyle was very excited about. However, everything changed once he started the program. The moment he arrived, he could see flaws in every professor's research. His mind was so expanded that he could instantly understand the implications of entire research projects, and he was able to see the weaknesses in them. Kyle would voice his concerns to his advisors, but they casually would brush him aside. He tried to stay motivated, but he couldn't stop seeing the flaws in the foundations of genetics. So eventually he decided to leave the program. And the day after he decided to leave, his life became a living hell. He couldn't sleep. His mind felt zapped. After a few days of this, two graduate students from his class began to reach out to him. It, Kyle thought this was strange because they never actually really talked in class. Then when Kyle went to actually hang out with them, they started acting very strange. Unprovoked, they would point their fingers at him in the shape of a gun and go pew pew like they were shooting at him. They kept doing this and Kyle wondered what their problem was. Later, Kyle writes in his manifesto, he discovered that they actually were not human, and they were tasked with making him the next school shooter. Anyway, Kyle continues, things slowly began to improve after he stopped talking with them, but still was mentally exhausted. However, in spring of 2015, Kyle's luck seemed to turn around, and he was invited to go to an interview with a prominent food company. Unfortunately, however, the interview didn't go very well, and he had to take a plane to get there. So anyway, on his plane ride back, things took a strange turn. An older gentleman sitting in front of him kept glancing back at him until he got his attention. And as he kept looking back, Kyle's head began to hurt and tingle. Right when this happened, the old gentleman's lips began to curl up into an evil-looking smile. 
pain in Kyle's head continued and got more intense as time went on. Every time Kyle felt it, the man would start taking notes in a notepad. About halfway through the flight, someone else in front of him held up a newspaper that said psychic reading for five minutes straight. It was blatantly obvious they were doing something to him, but he didn't know what. Once they landed, the older gentleman kept showing Kyle his track phone as if to say, get one of these. Now, Kyle had applied to several government agencies before this happened, so he thought this might be their way of contacting me. Out of curiosity, he decided to go buy a track phone. He would check it every day to see if anyone messaged or called. About a month later, he received a text message from a man named John P He invited him to come to church at the altar. It seemed to be like a strange place to be recruiting for government jobs, but Kyle went anyway. However, after he got there and went inside, something felt very wrong. He felt as if his life was in danger and became so uncomfortable he had to leave. A couple days later, Kyle started to receive other text messages from someone named Tim at the church. At first, they were innocuous Bible messages, but then he started threatening him. He sent messages talking about their power and other things. He then sent a final text message, which simply said, Angels. Kyle thought nothing of it until helicopters started flying around his house all day and night. At this point, he knew he was in trouble. He knew he needed to contact them, so he made an appointment to meet John Pella for coffee. After making the appointment to see John, something very bizarre happened. Kyle started to receive spontaneous, yeah, I'm going to say it, erections. It felt like someone was manually forcing him to have these at inappropriate times. And whenever this happened, a song would start playing in his head and it would repeat the same words over and over again, saying, he's just a plaything, we want to make him stay up all night. And according to him, they weren't kidding because he was not able to sleep at all each and every night. Each time he would drift off, he was woken up violently by the song. So one morning after all of this, Kyle gets out of bed and he's relieved because all of a sudden, the song stopped playing. He thought the torture was over. Well, until a voice entered his mind and said, you're going to be uncomfortable, all you have to do is breathe. While he sat there wondering what this meant, the voice spoke again, saying, You will be sacrificed like Jesus and get beheaded. Well, this threw Kyle into a complete panic, and he began to have a mental breakdown. A few minutes later, some man knocked on the door, and when Kyle answered, he gave him a pamphlet talking about the sacrifice of Jesus. This sent him into a complete delirium. Kyle figured he was never going to see his family again. He was going to die. And all he could think about was seeing them again. Now, they lived in Albuquerque at the time, so he decided to buy a one-way ticket there. When Kyle reached the Spokane airport, his panic began to subside. Everything was fine until he got on the plane. Kyle sat next to a huge man who kept telling him telepathically that he was going to crash the plane. And every time after he spoke, he would sniff emphatically. Kyle didn't know what to do, so he just sat there as calm as possible. Now, this angered the man, and he started touching Kyle's leg. And the second he did, Kyle could feel the man inside of his mind. This caused him to panic until he was on the verge of causing a scene. But before he did anything, the man told him to calm down. He said, you did a great job. You passed. Go enjoy your family. We have a job waiting for you when you get back. Kyle thanked him and felt slightly relieved, but he had no intention of contacting him at all. His only thought was to get as far away from him as possible. Now, after getting off the plane, Kyle headed to baggage claim, and a huge group of them surrounded him there. Kyle began watching them cautiously, and they all began to sniff at him. Kyle writes, the sniff is something they do all the time. I think it has something to do with dominance. When Kyle finally got his bag, he left the airport as fast as he could. His parents were right outside waiting to pick him up. He was so happy to see them again. He gave them big hugs and told them how much he loved them. However, he writes this was his last happy moment in Albuquerque because these people followed him everywhere they went. And whenever he saw one, they would sniff at him just to let him know that it was them. They would also smile, laugh, and stick out their tongues. Now, as time went on, they began coaxing him to go outside alone. Kai was scared to death that they would kill him, so he refused. Eventually, they threatened to harm his family, which caused him to give in to them. Kyle told them he would do whatever they wanted as long as they left his family alone. They responded by saying, go to church. He knew they meant the altar. So he agreed to go once he returned home. So when Kyle went to the altar, the people acted very strange, inhuman. As Kyle walked to the sermon room, everyone stared at him and began sniffing emphatically. Needless to say, he was scared, but still took a seat. 
When the service began, a man came and sat down next to him. After he sat down, Kyle began smelling something. It was a smell he never smelt before, like a reptile and vinegar. After Kyle smelled this, he became very uncomfortable. He tried to remain calm and just sat there quietly until the service was over. When the service ended, they said, you can leave now. After that whole experience, Kyle knew he wasn't dealing with government anymore. He realized that whoever he was dealing with was extraterrestrial. After this experience was over, Kyle received no further instructions from them, so he began applying for jobs again. Even though he had done exactly what he was told by them, they still followed him everywhere. As time went on, they started harassing him day and night. He began hearing voices more and more often, and he began to hallucinate things that he knew weren't real. They also started playing with him sexually. Both the males and the females would play out their fantasies in his mind. This, of course, came with more random and uncomfortable erections, as well as extreme prostate stimulation. The harassment continued for weeks and intensified as time went on. Kyle did his best to maintain his sanity and avoid them, this worked for a while, but eventually he had a huge meltdown. It was one day he was at the bakery when he was surrounded by a bunch of old men. Some of them looked at him and sniffed, so he knew it was them. They started stimulating his prostate simultaneously, and then they spoke aggressively. They said, Humans are nothing more than the result of a successful genetic experiment. You are a threat to the way these people think, and you can no longer be free in society. Your life is over. You are nothing but a toy. Your purpose is now to suck their private parts. They continue to say other explicit things, Kyle says, that are too obscene that he doesn't even want to repeat them. But before they finished talking, he became enraged. It took every ounce of willpower he had not to kill them. So he left the store and tried to calm down, but it only got worse. The rest of the night, they continued to stimulate him. It got to the point where he was in serious pain. They finally stopped after he broke down and became completely distraught. It was to the point where he couldn't take any more and attempted suicide. He filled a charcoal grill with lit coals, put it in his car, and rolled up the windows. He reclined his seat and went to sleep, and he should have died, but they woke him up in an extreme panic which caused him to get out of the car. As he slowly regained consciousness, Kyle was very upset to still be alive. He had no clue where to go, so he decided to check himself into the VA. They shipped him straight to the mental ward, but nothing improved. The medication they gave him did nothing. He just sat there surrounded by a bunch of psychotic people, and it was exasperating. He knew their goal was to ruin his life by making him into a crazy person. So he became determined to not let that happen and started fighting back. So after he was let go from the VA, Kyle went back to the altar to ask them what they wanted from him. At this point, Kyle was numb, and he wasn't even afraid anymore. So, he goes to the altar, he asks, what do they want from him? And they respond by saying, we want you as our sex slave. Thinking they were serious, Kyle sat there waiting for them to do something. But all they said was, keep coming to church. So he did. After a few more services, he found himself talking to Tim, the pastor, face to face. The pastor told Kyle he should become a minister. They were in mid-conversation when suddenly the pastor revealed his true form. He has no clue how he did it, and it only happened for one to two seconds. But Kyle was able to draw a sketch of what he saw. His eyes, really, are what stood out and captured his attention. They were huge and bulging. The eyelids were darker green, and the irises were yellow and brown with slit pupils. After witnessing this, nothing else happened. Kyle continued to attend the altar for a few more services, waiting for them to do something. They did nothing except tell him to submit and surrender. Kyle had no idea what they meant, so he finally left the church and never went back. After leaving the altar, they finally gave him some breathing room. They held back on their harassment, and Kyle began to recover. Kyle decided to make one final attempt at a normal life by pursuing a career as a pharmacist. He started taking classes at NIC to finish up the prereqs he needed. He also started volunteering at a local pharmacy. Unfortunately, though, they followed him to school. There were several of them in every class he took. They made it impossible for Kyle to study, and they continually harassed him, especially while taking tests. But even with everything going on, he still managed to get an A-. minus in A and P during the fall semester. Sadly though, this success was short-lived. The pressure in spring semester was far too intense. Every time he went to class, they started manipulating his brain until he got into a blind rage. They would flood his body with adrenaline. The females would stimulate his penis and the males would stimulate his prostate. Kyle wrote, this was incredibly exhausting. Every moment he spent in the classroom was absolute torture. 
The classes were already extremely difficult without all of this added pressure. Kyle concluded that his chance for a normal life was ruined. That he was too smart for his own good, so these entities decided to remove him from society. They were worried that he might change the way other people think, which could lead to problems. Problems in the form of scientific revolutions. If we get much smarter as a species, we are going to become a threat to their existence. Kyle writes that if you were to talk to him in person, you could see that he's not crazy at all. The Martians are just so good at hiding in plain sight that no one would know they exist unless they revealed themselves. They are able to fool us so well that what he's saying sounds impossible. However, they are 100% real. Realize their technology is millions of years more advanced than ours. And think about that. Think about the advancement we've made in the last 100 years. Once you've done that, try to imagine what millions of years of technology would look like. Kyle then writes, the president is well aware of them, which is why he wrote him a personal letter, and he hopes he does something about it, and that what Kyle did was his last resort to take action to bring this to the public's attention. And just to make things very clear, Tim and John in this story were not wild human beings. Wild humans are normal people like you and I, and Tim and John had minds who were controlled from birth by the Martians. He wants people to know that the pastor he believed he killed is not who we think. He says, it's hard to imagine, I know. Nonetheless, it's all true. Why would I give up a career as a pharmacist to do this? He says that he's actually left out many details from his story, but he wanted to write down the most critical events in order to make it coherent. And he says, if you want to know more, like how I discovered there are multiple species of them, feel free to write to me. And he actually is still serving out his prison sentence, somewhere in Idaho, I believe. In his manifesto, he also has a Q&A. One of the questions is, how do you know about their technology? He says, I've seen them use it, and they have talked to me about it. This was how I learned about their breeding stock of remote control humans. Physically, their humans are no different than us. They just lack a mind of their own. Why would they tell you so much? They value me because I'm smart. They were also very confident they could take control of my mind. Turns out they couldn't. Anyway, in the interim, some of us developed a personal relationship. They are very arrogant, so they told me much more than they should have. This allowed me to understand some of the things they can do. What else have you seen? I have seen them make things appear out of nowhere. One time I was sitting on a couch and a dollar bill appeared on my lap. Another time while driving, they made a paper bag appear in my passenger seat. They use random, unsuspecting items, so no one would think anything of it. I was alone both times this happened. I'm pretty sure they can pop in and out of this dimension based on other things I've seen. I'm also pretty sure they can overlap our reality with an alternate dimension. I say this because I have gone into stores, where I know the employees, and suddenly there are all new employees who I've never seen before. Kyle has another section in the manifesto labeled Martian Brain and Behavior. He says, I've observed their behavior for almost a year now. Consequently, I've been able to make several deductions about them. The first deduction is based on their primary characteristics, which include they are hypersexual, hyperaggressive, and they are fearful and paranoid. In the human brain, the amygdala is responsible for all these characteristics. Therefore, Martians must have an analogous structure, and it must be greatly enlarged. The males are extremely aggressive. In their society, there's only one thing, and that is power. Whoever is the smartest, biggest, and strongest wins. He also goes on to talk about the origins of humanity, some stuff about the Martian technology, and our biological species and electricity, which reads, Everything in our bodies runs on electrical impulses. Our brains operate over a wide range of electrical frequencies shown here. Everything we experience in life is simply the result of electrical activity. To be more precise, everything we experience is the sequence of a series of action potentials occurring in the central nervous system. If our perception occurs due to electrical impulses, it follows that it can be manipulated with the right technology. This is why Martians are able to directly alter our perception. They have the technology. They can trick our brain into visual and auditory hallucinations, smelling, tasting, heart rate fluctuations, erections, and every other CNS event. This provides a full explanation of how they manipulated my penis as described in my story. Read about the science behind an erection here if you're not convinced yet. So as you can see, Tesla was right. Energy, frequency, and vibration allow us to control the world around us. The Martians have known this for eons, and they use it against us. As I said before, they own a massive stock of humans, which they breed and control from birth. 
Since they have the technology to control a central nervous system, they can operate their humans like remote control toys. Unfortunately for us wild humans, they can control us too. Um, in his manifesto, he actually has an illustration of these amphibious beings he saw. So yeah, in conclusion, I would say that Kyle is a schizophrenic, and this is an excellent case study. However, I'm not going to dismiss him completely because on a spiritual level, I do believe that there are dark entities here. Kyle seems like a very sensitive person with a high IQ, high levels of imagination, and things just got a little too real. I mean, it is suspicious that the pastor lived after he shot him six times. I mean, Kyle actually was trained in the Marine Corps. He knew how, he knew how to use a gun. All of his shots hit. And for those of you who know guns, you know hollow point rounds expand once you shoot them, and they're made to kill. No one, no human, is able to survive that many shots. One of them hit him in the head. Five of them hit him in the torso. That is not human, if this report is accurate. And it seems to be so. This pastor was then suddenly elected to a somewhat prominent position in Idaho state government. And you know, maybe at the end of the day, perhaps this guy was protected by God and he's a really good person. I'm going to actually side with Occam's razor and say Kyle was schizophrenic. Like a severe case of it. But the fact that this pastor lived through an anatomically impossible to survive shooting is something that bothers me. So I don't know what that's all about. Either way, it's an interesting story. It was sort of hard for me to get through it just because it's so honestly crazy. And I hate to use that word because it's very dismissive. But I think Kyle would even agree. Like that's, it's hard to read because it's just, it's so out there. But very interesting nonetheless. And I have no doubt that he actually did truly experience all those horrible things. And he wrote that it was like he was tortured even worse than a POW. I have no doubt that he actually felt that. And hopefully these days, his mind is more at ease. So for any of you who want to read the manifesto, I'm going to provide a link in the description. But yes, that concludes the story of Kyle Odom.